Hey guys, Matt here. Going to get into Hebrews 9 today. I think we'll do 15 through 22, Lord willing. Um, we start off with the therefore. So of course you want to look at the verse previous. And the previous verse, 914 said, How much more will the blood of Christ purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So we saw that a couple chapters prior to that that the sacrifices that they were making in the Levitical priesthood couldn't wash their consciences clean, could not clean their consciences, right? Because even the sin washing was just a type and a shadow. They weren't getting forgiveness of sins. They were just getting a temporary atonement. Again, it was the credit card payment with the bill still coming, right? Verse 15, Therefore, because of this, He, Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. This is a big deal, because it isn't a promised temporary inheritance. It isn't a promised inheritance for a hundred years. It's a promised eternal inheritance. And there's some parts of Hebrews that gets a little dicey. Hebrews 6, 4 through 8, we saw where it looked like you could lose your salvation. And I, I think... I think the way I justify this or, or, or reconcile this in my brain is that those people weren't in Christ. They were close. They were on their way. They were the Matthew 13s, the seed. They received the seed, but the persecution because of the word, maybe the, the riches of this world, things were getting in their way. In, in this case, it was the persecution. These guys were getting, these guys were getting dinged for their faith pretty bad. Uh, but, but this new covenant and this new mediator, this Jesus Christ, who isn't really new at all. He's all over the Old Testament, right? This Jesus Christ is a mediator of a new covenant, and that new covenant, if we are called, if we answer the call, if we are born again, we receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems them and us from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Okay, more for the Jews here, but what he's saying is not only... Does Jesus Christ give you an eternal inheritance? But because of that, he washes clean all the transgressions committed. So these guys might have even, you know, they, they keep having to hear the same thing over and over. Jesus is high priest. There's a new covenant. He comes from a better line, the line of Melchizedek. Um, it's just a type and a shadow, guys. This temple worship, this, this tabernacles, uh, the tabernacle sacrifices. It's just a type and a shadow. And, and he goes even further here and he says, And all those sins that were being covered by the blood, they were never paid for. They were just atoned. It was just temporary. And here, Jesus Christ, he'll redeem you from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So he doesn't just forgive sins for today. Mm -mm. Uh, Jesus Christ forgives the sins past, present, and future. Right? For, and and we'll, we'll go a little bit farther with that, but let me read the next couple of verses. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. And this is just common knowledge. If you get uh, a, a will from your Uncle Harold, and you're named in his will, and your Uncle Harold's still alive, it doesn't mean much, right? It's a, it's a nice thought. But when Uncle Harold dies, you get the, the inheritance, right? What the author is saying here is when Jesus shed his blood, his perfect blood, not only could he cover your sins, okay? Think of it this way. They were sacrificing animals. The animal's blood atoned for their sins. It didn't pay for their sins. Jesus comes. He dies. If he's just a man, technically speaking, he could cover the sins of one man. But he's God and man. And because of that, he washes not only your sins, but everyone's sins past, present, and future, as long as they're born again, as long as they're in Christ, right? So that's what's happening here. And that will doesn't take effect until the death of Christ, until Christ dies and is buried and raises again. The power is in the resurrection. That's what he's saying here. Verse 19, uh, actually verse 18, Therefore not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. There was a shedding of blood in the first covenant, right? Just to cover, just to cover the sins temporarily. Verse 19, for when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself 
and all the people, think about this, all the people, and he said, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he then sprinkled with blood both the tent, the tabernacle, and all the vessels, uh, the, the altars, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the lampstand, the altar of incense, all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Okay, so Moses, check this out. Really, really slow down and think about this. So you're a Jew. You're, in, you're a Jew and you're, you're sitting under Moses and Moses is inaugurating the, the tabernacle. Okay? So you're out there in the crowd of, of Hebrews, or crowd of Jews, right? Moses takes the, the scarlet hyssop and the, and the uh, uh, whatever the other thing was, and he sprinkles it in a vat. The scarlet wool and the hyssop, sorry, I mix those up. He sprinkles it in a vat, in a, in a basin, with, with water and blood. I'm, I'm imagining to, to dilute the blood a little bit, I don't know. So he sprinkles it, he dabs it in there, and then he he shakes it and he sprinkles it all over the crowd so you're standing out there and you started getting drops of blood all over you wow there's blood on the tent there's blood on that beautiful ark of the covenant there's blood on the beautiful lamp stain sand right there's blood all over the altars there's blood everywhere even on the ten commandments there's blood and uh it really makes us stop and think that wow this this blood is, is a big deal. Moreover, this sin is a big deal. We serve a holy God, and sin is a big deal to God, and it should be a big deal to us. Moreover, on top of all that, even though this elevates our view of sin, it elevates our, our view of the holiness of God, it elevates the price that Jesus paid once and for all. There is, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And the, sh the only blood, the only blood that can forgive us for our sins is the blood of Jesus. Like the song says, nothing but the blood of Jesus, right? And so this section here, we need to think about it. Because if, if you're unfamiliar with the Levit Levitical ways or the, the, the law and the temple worship, you might read this and think, wow, I never knew that. I never knew they got sprinkled with blood. Yeah, it was a serious thing. And that's why what Jesus did is all the more important. He put an end to all that, and he washed away our sins. He bridged the gap between us and God. He was the, He provided tabernacle, right? He provided God and man the connection. Jesus bridged the gap through the shedding of his blood. And remember, if he was just a man, he could only pay for a man's sin. The, the, the blood of animals could not wash away their sins. The blood of animals only covered them temporarily. The blood of a man could wash away, theoretically, could wash away one, one man. But the blood of Jesus washes away all sin for anyone who will put their faith and trust in him and repent, turn from their sins, and turn to Jesus Christ. Have you done that? Do it today. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Don't do it. Serve your God. Because we're going to find out tomorrow that it is appointed once for a man to die and then the judgment. Peace.